right so we are talking about uh, ethics in palliative care today and um, uh, as uh, shripya rightly mentioned it is it is a very different uh, topic because uh, we do uh, practice uh, you know um, uh, our medical science within the purview of ethics uh, within the boundaries set by medical ethics but at the same time uh, you know we actually come across certain situations in our day to day practice where we really get confused which way to go and uh, that is where uh, you know we must have a um, you know i should say at least the basic minimum knowledge about uh, the uh, ethical uh, uh, dilemmas or ethical considerations or uh, you know the um, basic uh, know how about which uh, ethical um, principle to practice so um yeah so uh, 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 we would uh, like to first uh, see uh, the definition uh, and then discuss about four cardinal principles and uh, uh, something which is a very hot topic uh, which is euthanasia because um, you know we as doctors are uh, inclined to actually slip through the slippery slope all the time um when we talk about terminal care so being in palliative care uh, you know those of you who are already uh, you know practicing some bit of palliative care uh, in yours within your specialty or uh, um, there might be somebody who is actually taken up palliative care as a full time work uh, you know uh, for them uh, i think um, uh, knowing about euthanasia is uh very very important okay so um uh it is ethics are nothing but a moral code of behavior there's a particular code of how we behave uh in front of our patients uh what we convey to our behavior uh what kind of message are we given to uh to the society um so ethical principles are generally a set of principles in a moral account which should function as an analytical framework that expresses the general values underlying the common morality so this is the uh, particular definition of ethical principle and uh, it, uh, this particular definition is actually a uh, you know uh, an, an explanation in itself you can actually see that we uh these principles are uh, taken on a moral account and uh, you know this is a analytical framework where we have to function within which we have to function and uh, uh, this will express the general values underlying the common morality of work so uh, coming to uh, the ethics of palliative care uh, they generally uh they are uh, uh, you know uh, similar to those of medicine in general i shouldn't say similar it they are uh, actually those of uh, uh, you know the ethics of medicine in general um but having said this uh, we as doctors we have uh, a dual responsibility firstly we have to preserve life and secondly we need to relieve the suffering of people you know that is why we are made Uh, that is that is what the doctors are meant to do so we need to preserve life and we need to relieve the suffering but the having said this as palliative care physicians uh, you know we are we get our patients at the end of life uh, mostly i am working in a cancer organization i have been practicing cancer palliative care since the time i chose to practice the uh, palliative care and henceforth you know maximum patients most of my patients are at the end of life and uh, uh, hence uh, and that's why uh, you know uh, 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 um, we know that uh, we have a dual responsibility uh, responsibility but at the at the end of life the relief of suffering becomes more in, uh, important as the preservation of life becomes increasingly impossible you know we are not gods so we are not meant to save lives at the uh, you know at the cost of anything 
uh, that is a kind of a, 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 a stage that we all pass through. But we need to understand that when the, uh, it is the end of life, when we know that the person is no longer going to be with us, uh, the relief of suffering becomes even more important uh, when the uh, person is actually going away from us. So there are four cardinal principles um, uh, in general and as applied to palliative care practice also. So uh, these are patient autonomy, which means what the patient wants and uh, does the family actually understand uh, the preferences of the patients. Second, it is the beneficence, the principle of beneficence. Uh, is it going to benefit the patient? Then uh, the principle of non-maleficence, non uh, is it going to harm the patient? And last but not the least, it is the principle of justice. So are we utilizing the resources in a fair and uh, able manner as uh, you know, uh, as uh, opposed to the kind of resources that we have. So uh, why do we want to learn about ethics? Why, why, is it you know, why is it important that we know about all the ethical principles? That is because, uh, you know, while we practice medicine, uh, you know, we, uh, we are uh, sometimes in, in a crossroad where uh, you know, there, are, there is a conflicting um, possibility, there's a possibility of conflict between two uh, different principles, okay? And uh, 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 at that point of time, uh, it seems that both of these uh, uh, principles actually apply in this situation. And we really don't know which principle to take because uh, 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 you know, it seems that uh, we are, our intent is good. We are going to benefit the patient. But then uh, at the same time, uh, we think that not doing anything uh, will actually also, uh, um, uh, you know, keep the patient uh, in a better place. So uh, these kind of situations are known as dilemmas. And since we are talking about ethics, the principles, uh, we consider such situations in our medical practice as ethical dilemmas. So ethical dilemmas is considered a con conflict of moral principles occurring when a person faces certain situations where adhering to one particular principle might result in the violation of the other. So from here on, I would request uh, the whole uh, house to please participate uh, so that you know it doesn't become boring for you and uh, I would like to have your responses on uh, the cases that I'm going to show you uh, that will go, that will make us uh, you know a little bit more on the same page so that I understand where you stand and you understand what I'm talking so uh, uh, let us uh, look at this particular patient so this is a patient with a jaw tumor uh, and um, uh, I'm talking about uh, a patient uh, with a cancer of the jaw. And uh, he has, as you can see in the picture, he has a orocutaneous fistula. Okay. He's an elderly person. He's in pain. Um, fortunately, uh, there is no distant metastasis from this particular tumor. Now, for the treatment to uh, you know, happen, for the treatment to be carried on, uh, this patient needs to have a NG tube insertion or a Riles tube insertion, okay? Now, the patient is actually refusing to take this NG tube insertion. So, what is your stand? What is our stand on this? What are we going to do with this patient? Because we know that putting an NG tube will actually, uh, you know, uh, give us space to treat the patient, maybe he can be cured uh, if an NG tube is insert, inserted and we get more space uh, uh, for the oncologist or the, for the oncology team to carry on with the um, treatment. Now, what uh, the patient is refusing to take the NG tube. What is our stand on this? Can I have some responses? 
you can put your responses in the chat box also or uh, if you'd like to talk you can unmute and talk also um, so yeah can i have some responses okay so i can see in the chat that uh, Mr. Manoj, Dr. Manoj uh, Kumar has said that uh, there should be a peg feed, okay. Uh, so beneficence, all right. Counseling the patient and explain so that we give pain medicine, okay. Counsel him for his better good, okay. Try counseling, counseling the dire need of NG tube, counseling, counsel him. No distant metastasis, so good prognosis with surgery. You should counsel for RT. Yes, absolutely. Uh, try to counsel about detailed counseling again and again. Okay, very good. Yeah. Can we ask him why he doesn't want the absolutely right? I think uh, Dr. Amulya Kamalnath uh, has actually uh, you know, given us a clue that can we ask him why he doesn't want the NG tube? Uh, Dr. Swati is also saying that if going with a Autonomy, we need to respect patient's decision, but beneficent to be decided by the doctor. Okay, uh, yes, point well taken. Um, okay, relieve his pain first and then talk to him about his benefits of NGT. Okay, so uh, great responses. Thank you so much for your responses. So um, uh, you see what we need to do, we need to understand where is the dilemma, okay? So we are going, we, uh, by putting him on the NG tube, we want to do good to him. And that means we are, we, uh, uh, it's a question of doing uh, the principle of beneficence. And then uh, the patient is actually refusing. So we have to understand that the, uh, the patient's choice is also needs to be considered. So that is autonomy of the patient. So the dilemma is between doing good or beneficence and patient's choice, which is, which is patient autonomy. I think every one of you have actually pointed this out very well. And uh, so, uh, you know, uh, we need to understand first, what is patient autonomy? Okay. If we understand both the things, uh, you know, side by side, we'll be able to find a, a common way out. Uh, so that's the reason why I am actually uh, trying to explain you about these things together. So patient autonomy one, the foremost things uh, is that the patient needs to be involved in the decision making. That is extremely, extremely important. And why is it important? Because the patient has a right to have dignity, he has a right to have the privacy, and he has a right to confidentiality also. He also has a right to have the correct information, okay, the right kind of information. And the right to make decisions or take his own decisions. And when the treatment decision has to come, uh, it has to be from the patient himself. And that is what an informed choice is. So uh, uh, patient autonomy generally means all these four things taken together. And it culminates uh, uh, or, you know, it facilitates the patient to take the correct kind of decision. Now, uh, for this particular patient, um, you know, what is his autonomy? Okay. His autonomy is that he is refusing, his choice is that he is refusing to take the uh, NG tube. So how do we approach this patient? Uh, everybody of you actually pointed out that we should be counseling him. So I am talking about how to do that counseling, how to, uh, you know, start counseling this patient. Number one, you please, uh, you know, take an informed refusal. And how do we do that? We have to check the understanding of the patient. Number one, ask the patient why, uh, you know, uh, uh, what he understands by taking this um, uh, by by uh, uh, by ng tube insertion. What does he understand about it? Okay, he might actually tell you that. Uh, so this is going to pierce my nose, go inside my brain, and then you know get. Uh, 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 it's going to give me 
much more pain than I am having now. So, you know, uh, if you do not ask, if you do not give him an open question about uh, what his understanding is regarding the procedure, then I think uh, there's no point actually counseling the patient at all. So it's important that we understand what his understanding about the procedure is. Number two, uh, uh, you explore the reasons. Uh, uh, some, somebody has actually very nicely pointed out that can we check uh, his, uh, you know, uh, why he is uh, refusing uh, the NG tube insertion. So when you explore the reasons, this why will be answered. There'll be many, there might be many reasons, you know. He must, he might be actually, uh, he must, might be understanding that this particular NG tube or Ryle's tube is going to go, go uh, through my nose, to my stomach, help me uh, take my meals or, you know, liquid meals uh, that I am not able to take now. Uh, but then who's going to make the liquid meals for me? So th that might be a big reason, you know. There's nobody to take care of him. He might be scared that, uh, you know, if, if, if they put the liquid um, food through this pipe, it might go into my lungs or it might damage somewhere else. So you explore the reason second, and then you come to counseling. And when we speak, when we talk about counseling, uh, we just do not, uh, you know, hammer the patient with all kinds of things that we know. Um, we, we have to actually uh, tick mark on the understandings, tick mark on the reasons that he has uh, given for refusal and try to, uh, you know, uh, uh, clear out the doubts that he has, um, uh, uh, you know, because of which he has, uh, he doesn't have a clear understanding or he is refusing uh, the NG tube because of reasons which are not, uh, which are perhaps a little uh, baseless for him to think so. So we counsel the patient only after these two steps. And uh, even after counseling, you come to know or you realize that the patient is still actually refusing. Uh, your moral responsibility as a doctor is to stand by the patient. And, uh, you know, uh, even if you do not agree with his decision, just keep the door open always. That uh, doesn't matter. Um, you you are important. Uh, you are an important person for us. Uh, you know uh, your life is also valuable. So I respect your decision. So whenever you feel that uh, uh, you know uh, you are uh, uh, you are okay to uh, talk to me about this, uh, my door is always open. So you. Uh, you know, keep your door open. Do not just get offended because he is not listening to you or uh, he seems to just, uh, you know, uh, 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 oppose uh, what you are trying to say. Uh, do not think that um, uh, he, uh, you know, your intents are uh, not getting through uh, to him in a positive manner. Always support him. In my career of the last 20 years that I am in palliative care, I have actually seen patients who have refused NG tube, uh, um, uh, you know, insertions have actually come back to me with the request that, yes, madam, I think uh, you are right in your decision. I would like to now uh, go for an NG tube uh, insertion because I know that uh, it's going to help me. So believe me in that. Uh, even when you have a patient like this, uh, if the patient is refusing, give that patient some time to think. Give that patient some space uh, uh, because he has been going through a lot, okay? And he really doesn't want to uh, get physically and mentally hurt once again, all right? So uh, keep that thing in, in mind and take always take an informed refusal. Now, uh, this is uh, another patient. Uh, this is a 20-year-old boy, and he has a osteosarcoma of the lower end of the femur. Uh, he has a huge tumor. Uh, he also has multiple lung metastases, and he's suffering from severe anemia because of the uh, tumor itself. 
Now he wants an amputation, okay? Uh, doctors are refusing uh, to operate on him, but he wants an amputation and he thinks um, that, uh, you know, uh, after uh, uh, maybe the surgery, he'll become better. Now, you know that this is a very, very risky tumor. And uh, considering his general uh, uh, condition where he has severe anemia, he is bedridden, uh, you try to explain the risks to him, but uh, he is adamant that he will continue with the amputation. Now, uh, I would like you to give your responses on this particular patient also. Any responses in the chat box? If you want to talk, please feel free to uh, give your responses. Any responses? Okay, so we have one chat here. Uh, okay, so ask him why uh, he wants the amputation and explain that amputation can be done, but it is only a matter of time till his general condition can be improved medically, then can proceed. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, Dr. Harini has said we should counsel him uh, that it's fatal. Okay. Yes. Uh, can he demand a try of his choice? Uh, a treatment of his choice, okay. Of course, he can demand. He can demand a treatment. I mean, every patient has the right to demand the treatment of his choice, right? So that is patient autonomy. We are talking about patient autonomy here. Uh, Dr. Ramadevi says, respect his wish and explain and support him, okay. Explain the risk benefit, okay. Informed consent. Patient can exercise his right to treatment, okay. Again, dilemma between autonomy and ma non maleficence Absolutely bang on, Dr. Swati. Uh, okay, ask him the reason for his request for amputation. Check his pain level, okay. Tell him all pros and cons of amputation. Have to explain the various choices available, all right. Ethical dilemma, explain him the risks of amputation now. Ask him why he wants amputation, okay? But again, the reason needs to be sorted out and counseling, right? Okay, so, uh, so we are talking about um, a dilemma between doing good, uh, as Dr. Swati has rightly pointed out, and avoiding harm, and that is non maleficence okay? So we want to do good by not, uh, uh, you know, taking up the procedure and, uh, henceforth, uh, you know, a non maleficence avoidance of harm. Now, how do we approach this patient? Okay. Discuss him, discuss with him what are his chances of cure. All right. Uh, you can actually explore the reasons why he is wanting the uh, amputation, and you'll actually find out that he is very, very hopeful of cure. But then we know that uh, a, a huge, a large osteosarcoma with poor general condition and basically with multiple metastases to the lungs, um, the chances of cure is um, nearly zero. We are not going to save the patient. And if we put him up on the operating table, it is more likely that we are going to lose the patient on the table itself. The surgeon will not actually operate on him. So uh, is the survival even likely? So uh, when he's asking these questions, when he is uh, very adamant on that, the counseling should start from uh, the chances of cure after the operation, the chances of survival during the operation, if we take him up for the, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, operation. And the question that will, even if he survives, will the amputation improve his condition? Is it uh, um, uh, you know, uh, going to put an end to, uh, uh, to the cancer that he has developed? Uh, what about the lung metastasis? 
Uh, are we also going to, uh, you know, cut off the lungs? So all these things need to be talked about, need to be discussed with this particular patient. So uh, the third dilemma, um, uh, similar, a similar case of a 20 year old boy, he has an advanced cancer, he's under your care. Uh, now the relatives have actually insisted that issues of diagnosis and prognosis should not be discussed with him, okay? So when you go to see him one day, he's all alone in the ward or in the room, and he asks you, what is wrong with him? So what will you tell him? So this is a 20 year old boy. He doesn't know that he has an advanced cancer. He might be knowing that he just has cancer. He doesn't know that it has actually progressed to an advanced level where he is not going to be cured. And uh, the relatives, uh, in fact, they have insisted that uh, the diagnosis should not be revealed. The prognosis must not be discussed. So what do you do when one fine day, when he's alone, he's taken a chance to talk to you and asks for, uh, you know, what is wrong with him? So, okay. So Dr. Gurinder has said that he's an adult and he has a right to know. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. Uh, Dr. Harini says that he is a major and has all the rights to uh, know about his diagnosis and his uh, prognosis. Absolutely. I, I agree with that. Okay. Dilemma between autonomy and justice. Okay. And the right to know. He is 20 years. He has the right to be involved in decision making. Absolutely right. Absolutely true. So I'm asking, these are all that we know, we are considering, okay? But what I'm asking, what, I'm, what I need to know from you is that what are you going to do when the relatives have actually told you not to tell him? So how are you going to proceed? Uh, you're all correct. So Dr. Henson says that he has a right to know because he may have things to do or say, but can't disrespect the wishes of the bystanders. Better to counsel the bystanders about the above and ask them to consider. Absolutely right, absolutely right. Um, so you see, uh, it, is, it is really, uh, uh, you know, a deliberate misleading for a person uh, to withhold the information, okay? Um, and uh, we must not do that at the insistence of the patient's relatives. That is, really not to be done. It is a deliberate misleading for a person or a patient. The patient, as you all have said, has the right to know. Now, how do we, uh, uh, you know, how do we proceed for that particular patient? We have to counsel the patient. We have to talk to the relatives, okay? We have to, uh, you know, this particular approach will be actually taught, uh, will be actually um, uh, taught in your uh, uh, communication skills classes. But, uh, you know, uh, 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 coming out of an ethical dilemma generally, uh, uh, you know, involves a lot of communication skills, okay? So one thing is for sure that if you are going to, uh, you know, um, uh, offend the relatives of this particular person, uh, uh, you cannot actually take the right decision or, uh, you know, you will, be, uh, you will be at a loss of uh, not helping the person because you know that the patient wants to know it. Still, you are being barred from giving the uh, uh, correct uh, prognosis and diagnosis. And henceforth, we are actually stopping that person uh, to know his diagnosis and perhaps uh, you know, after uh, 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 he might be uh, in a in a situation where he will not be able to even fulfill his last wishes. Okay, so these are the things that you will need to talk to the relatives first. So by talking to the relatives, uh, you are actually uh, bringing them into your team. You have to uh, build up that particular confidence with the relatives first. Okay, you have to tell them that uh, uh, maybe he has 
uh, only uh, only two months left and in another two months would you not want your child or your uh, you know son to actually fulfill his last wishes will you not regret after uh, that after he's gone so <coughs> so all these things need to be uh, discussed first with the relatives and maybe uh, you know you can actually proceed uh, by uh, you know uh, uh, getting both of uh, the parties the patient and the relatives together uh, one day um, and then uh, facilitate a discussion between themselves you know um, when there is a gap uh, when there is a communication gap between the relatives and the patient uh, where the relatives or the parents or the elder brother or elder sister they 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 are actually their intention is to protect uh, their loved one from getting hurt okay they uh, their intention is that you know uh, he's going he's he's just going to have a shock all right many a times uh, you know when we face this kind of a situation uh, you know uh, once um, uh, this some somebody actually one relative told me madam please don't tell him the diagnosis he will have a heart attack and he will die right now you know all these things have actually uh, come up from uh, our the great bollywood uh, movies where they show that you know when the uh, a person is in the uh, on a bed and he is being told about the diagnosis uh, there is a heart attack all the while the scene actually is shown that the, there is a heart attack as soon as he listens to the diagnosis and he is he is dead so these things are actually rampant in the society people don't know that these things doesn't happen that way so uh, you know uh, uh, it's very important that we facilitate the communication uh, between the relatives and the uh, patient uh, because we want to do good to our patient okay and uh, the relatives must not uh, feel uh, that they have been betrayed by the doctor because they have requested the doctor not to tell anything to the patient but then once you uh, start communicating once you start showing them the reasons why it is important for them to uh, you know give this diagnosis discuss about the prognosis uh, for the patient uh, it becomes absolutely clear and uh, uh, you know you'll see in your day to day practice uh, that they really want your help in telling this thing to the patient okay so uh, something in the chat yes dr narayana dr bhargav dr swati you have actually uh, told uh, yeah that is what we were actually yes it is known as breaking the bad news absolutely uh, absolutely dr narayana thank you thank you okay so uh, this is another ethical dilemma um, so now uh, a little bit of clinical thing that we can discuss so um, a 50 year old lady she's uh, she's come to uh, she has a diagnosis of uh, carcinoma of the stomach she has come to the hospital in a terminal state and um, uh, this terminal state uh, might be uh, because of an internal bleeding of her uh, you know uh, the primary cancer uh, you find that her systolic bp is 50 mm of mercury and she's extremely extremely restless now will you give her parenteral midazolam which might hasten her death so what is your take on this particular case any responses any responses please okay so all right so you don't want to give her parenteral midazolam okay so dr j hansen says that it's better to give midazolam it may hasten death but death at this stage seems inevitable and will make her comfortable during her last days yes i agree with you 
Dr. Priya says no. Dr. Rama Devi says yes. Dr. Amulya says, I think it is okay to give parental sedation, okay? If she wants, Dr. Harini, okay? So Dr. Harini, she may not be in that particular stage to actually say that I want sedation. Okay, so Dr. Varalakshmi says yes. Dr. Bhargav says, I don't think it's not important, okay? All right, okay, okay. So let us, let us just, uh, I have one more chat or what? Yeah. Does she has an advanced directive? Well, that's an important question. Yes, utility of treatment, discussion with family and decide. Great, very nice uh, responses. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So um, when you attend the, your class on end of life care, uh, uh, you, will, uh, you will appreciate the fact that um, parental midazolam is the gold standard of treatment of terminal restlessness, okay? So this particular scene where we have just a little bit of fact that uh, the patient is a CA stomach uh, patient in a terminal stage, uh, which is because of an internal bleeding with a BP of 50 millimeters of mercury and restlessness, uh, we we will take this, we'll assume it that she's in the last stage of her life and uh, she's perhaps going to actually uh, die because of this. Now, our moral responsibility as palliative care physicians is to relieve her of her suffering. She is suffering because at this particular stage will actually relieve her of restlessness. Terminal restlessness, I, uh, you know, I don't know how many of you have actually worked in the ICU, but you must, you must have seen uh, people in terminal restlessness where they are strained, uh, you know, the hands and legs are strained and uh, they are just restless. They cannot, uh, uh, they cannot say what they want, you know. It is, it is a disturbing scene to see, right? Many ICU doctors have actually written books and poems on how uh, uh, you know, difficult it is to uh, see a terminal patient in restlessness. So why not, uh, why don't we give something to relieve that person of restlessness? What is the fact that stops us? Now, the point here is, uh, the question is, is it right to give some medication to a terminally ill person which may inadvertently hasten the person's death? Now, the, the term that I have used here is inadvertently hasten death. And that means that my intention of, uh, you know, giving this person a shot of midazolam uh, is not to... Uh, uh, you know, not to induce death. It is to induce uh, the relief of suffering for this particular patient at the last, perhaps the last day or last hours of life. Now, uh, we have to consider uh, something very important, something very important in such situations, okay, which is known as a principle of double effect. So, the principle of double effect actually says that a single act of having two possible foreseen effects, one good and one harmful, is not always morally prohibited if the harmful effect is not intended. Now, in this particular poor lady who's actually uh, going to die, perhaps in the next 24 hours, is absolutely restless. And we know that midazolam uh, will actually give her a positive uh, effect, which, uh, uh, you know, a good effect, which is a relief of the restlessness and uh, which is going to give her a lot of relief at this particular stage. But at the same time, we also know that midazolam might also hasten her death. 
okay but we are actually not intending the harmful effect of midazolam to take place what we are intending is that we want to give relief to this particular patient so henceforth uh, according to the principle of double effect midazolam uh, 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 will have two possible forcing effects one will be good one will be harmful but it is not always morally prohibited okay so this is the principle of double effect that you have to follow in your practices whenever you have such kind of a situation all right so see uh, uh, one example of principle of double effect is also the use of morphine tablets okay we morphine has side effects what are the side effects it induces nausea and vomiting it induces constipation okay in a patient but are we not going to uh, give uh, the patient with um, uh, you know severe pain uh, the uh, relief of pain by using morphine are we actually going to uh, um, uh, you know uh, we told ourselves to prescribe morphine because he is going to have nausea and vomiting and constipation okay so that particular uh, situation is also a principle of double effect let me give you another very very uh, simple example people uh, diabetics are on anti hypoglycemic drugs okay we know that anti hypoglycemic drugs may, may also actually uh, you know uh, lead the patient some uh, at one point of time to hypoglycemia all right so uh, aren't we not uh, giving the patient are we not prescribing the patient uh, uh, these drugs huh? we know that it is going to do that harm but still we are doing that because we our intention is to maintain a euglycemic eff effect on the patient our intention is not to uh, do any kind of harm or uh, you know even if you know that is, that is going to harm the patient okay so another uh, example another ethical dilemma um, so this is a 74 year old gentleman with advanced carcinoma of the lung who has completed a course of radiotherapy and two courses of chemotherapy is brought to the casualty he is drowsy his pulse is feeble uh, his systolic bp is 60 mm and the breathing pattern is altered now the uh, family wanted everything possible done for him so what do we do in such a situation do we actually resuscitate and shift him to the icu do we investigate more on what his situation is going to be like are we going to give him some hemodynamic and ventilatory support are we also going to do some kind of hydration and nutrition so this this, this type of scenarios are also uh, you know filled with dilemmas because this is a 74 year old gentleman uh you know he's actually had all the courses of treatment that he want he needed or wanted or was prescribed now he is in the last stage of his cancer and is going to die uh, which is very very evident from uh the clinical scenario that has been explained now in such kind of a situation we need to understand what an appropriate treatment means okay so what are we we have to do something for this gentleman right we need to do something for this gentleman so uh, on at the insistence of the uh, caregivers or the relatives or bystanders are we actually going to resuscitate him are we going to give uh, you know all kind of fancy treatment that is available in our hospital so the appropriate treatment is that it does not provide the net benefit to the patient uh may ethically and legally be withdrawn and the goal of medicine should shift to the palliation of symptoms okay so this is uh you know um, uh, the definition of an appropriate treatment right so what are the key points we have to look 
uh, we have to take into consideration the patient's biological prospects, okay? Is he actually going to get better on his breathing pattern? Is his, uh, you know, advanced stage going to culminate into a, a less advanced stage? Or what is the therapeutic aim and benefit of each treatment that we are going to give him? Is ventilatory support going to help him come out of the cancer? Uh, is the, uh, we have to consider ad the adverse effects of each treatment that we describe. For example, you know, uh, the radiation oncologist might actually come and say, oh, all right, let us uh, try him on another uh, shot of radiotherapy. Is that going to uh, give him some benefit? And the need uh, of not to prescribe a lingering death. So these are the appropriate treatment key points that we need to consider while we, uh, you know, take care of people who are in the advanced stage or in the, you know, uh, in a stage where, uh, from where they are actually not going to come back. So this brings us to uh, the principle of justice. And it says that uh, there, uh, there is a need of balancing of the individual with that of the society the balance between the needs of the individual with that of the society. So uh, uh, let me explain the principle of justice with this particular example. So this is Mr. SS who's, a, who's 86 year old. He was a journalist, uh, a war correspondent, who was a thinker and a writer. So he's actually a very uh, kind of a prominent person in the society. You know, he's seen so many things and done such good work. Um, uh, he is a lung cancer patient with metastasis to the spine, the ribs, and the sacrum. Um, unfortunately, one of his son is a patient of a psychiatric disorder. Uh, he has six grandchildren of the son, and um, he has certain, uh, you know, goals to look uh, forward to. Okay, he needs his pain to be taken care of. His family finances need, needs to be um, looked into. He also wants to do uh, the Geneva Sanskar of uh, three of his grandsons. Okay, but unfortunately, uh, his breathlessness has been increasing. Now, um, if we uh, think about putting this patient into, into the ICU and uh, you know, trying to give him that particular goals of care that he looks forward to, are we actually doing justice, okay? Is, will that be a fair utilization of resources where, uh, you know, the family has one psychiatric patient, the family has six grandchildren to be brought, uh, uh, you know, and at the same time, um, uh, does our hospitals in India actually uh, will be uh, doing a justice of fairly allocating uh, the hospital's resources to people like Mr. S's, okay? So why I'm saying this is that uh, once we put this person into the ICU, we're actually blocking that particular bed, okay? It seems to be very... Um, insensitive when I talk like this, but this is a fact, okay? In a population, in a highly populated country like India, where uh, so many people do not actually get access to healthcare, we're talking about blocking an ICU bed for a person who's actually going to die, who's actually seen his whole life. But then will it not be um, unfair for a person, for a uh, you know, young person who's just had a head injury and has been looking for a bed in the ICU and you do not have an ICU bed because one of your patients uh, who's an 86-year-old gentleman suffering from advanced lung cancer is going to die, but the need also needs the ICU admission. So, you know, this is um, in a nutshell the principle of justice. We, we have to take some strong decisions uh, when we consider uh, allocating our very, very uh, precious resources to our patients also.
So this brings to uh, the concept of euthanasia. So are they actually going to, uh, you know, provide euthanasia to Mr. S.S.? Um, are we going to do that? So let us, let us talk about this. So euthanasia is an act or procedure in which someone takes active means, such as a lethal injection, to bring about someone's death. Okay, so let us get this thing very straight. So the point is that we are doing something, uh, a procedure where uh, we are taking an active means. Uh, that active means uh, might be in the form of a lethal injection. And that is being done to bring about somebody's death, a patient's death. Okay, so this is what is meant by euthanasia. Now, allowing natural death to occur is not considered euthanasia, okay? And when we say allowing natural death, uh, we mean that we are withholding a futile treatment or we are withdrawing a futile treatment that has been done to a patient. Okay, and that particular futile treatment might be a invasive ventilation. Okay, so this is in a nutshell about euthanasia, which is legal in Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, and some few more countries which I have not mentioned here. The point is in IPC section 88, we also have a legal provision of not doing anything. Okay, doing nothing to bring about the, uh, 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 you know, bring about death naturally. Okay, but unfortunately, we really don't have anything, uh, any kind of practice uh, that has shown that this IPC section 88 is being legally utilized. Okay, so IPC section 88 says that nothing which is not intended to cause death is an offense by reason of any harm which it may cause or be intended by the doer or cause or be known by the doer to be likely to cause to any person for whose benefit it is done in good faith and who has given a consent whether expressed or implied to suffer that harm or to take the risk of that harm okay so this particular thing is has been made absolutely complex but i'm sure that in your end of life care uh, you know class you will definitely be told about the new advanced directives uh, that have been you know uh, uh, now um, uh, passed by the supreme court uh, very recently in january 2023 and um, i'm sure you're going to understand uh, the simplified version of bringing about the advanced directives to India, okay? All hospitals uh, and, um, you know, all um, institutions, health institutions can actually now uh, uh, get a very simplified version of advanced directives. I remember advanced directives because one of you had rightly mentioned about advanced directives a little while ago. So what is futile care? Why do we actually do futile care? What is futile uh, futility of what is the futility of care? So physicians are not ethically obligated to deliver care that in their best professional judgment will not have a reasonable chance of benefiting their patients. It is as simple as that and has been very rightly mentioned in the AMA code of medical ethics. Okay, we are not at all ethically obligated okay, to deliver any kind of care. Nobody can force us to give a care which is absolutely futile, which is not, you know, uh, reasonable enough to benefit our patients. So please, from today, always take this on your hands, on your uh, fists, that we as physicians are not ethically bound to deliver any sort of care which is actually not going to benefit our patients, okay? and 
if at all we do that, we're actually doing a futile kind of a care. So unfortunately, uh, you know, doctors uh, do go for futile treatment and they do it because they're not oriented. Uh, you know, they are always have been oriented to curative treatment. You know, whenever, uh, you know, when I went into MBBS and I'm sure when you got into MBBS, the only thing, thing that we knew is that we will one day have the power to fight death, okay? We will cure our patients and we'll, uh, you know, make our patients um, uh, from a bedridden patient uh, to go out of our clinic smiling and happy, okay? But unfortunately, uh, that is really not the reality, okay? Uh, um, um, as, uh, as a palliative care physician, um, I can tell you that my acceptance to, um, you know, the non-curative options that we have today has improved cons considerably, okay? So I just wish that uh, uh, almost uh, all uh, doctors would have some bit of training in palliative care, okay? There is always a fear of uh, being blamed for suboptimal treatment, okay? Oh, this doctor, you know, has given just one paracetamol and no, no other uh, medications. Uh, the prescription is too small. So this is the kind of, uh, you know, pressure that we generally face while we practice, all right? So, uh, and that is a fear that, uh, that's always constantly inside our minds that uh, we are we'll be blamed for some suboptimal treatment. Ye treatment kiya hai nahi. Unhone to diya hai nahi kuch bhi. Okay. He said that it will be naturally gone. So they just don't want uh, that to happen. All right. There is an ignorance about the guidelines for end of life care. People do not know that the guidelines for end of life care exist. And definitely uh, the question of euthanasia. Okay. So uh, I... Uh, I would suggest everybody out here to actually go to the um, Indian Journal of Palliative Care site. Um, that's an open access uh, 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 journal. And you can actually look for the end of life care policy. And this is an integrated care plan for the dying and jointly uh, given as a statement uh, from the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine and the Indian Association of Palliative Care. Please go and look at the guidelines. It, those are beautiful guidelines and absolutely simple to follow. Uh, you know, uh, this is now being developed into advanced directives also. So, uh, 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 you know, uh, when we talk about the question of euthanasia, uh, we, we must actually understand uh, the difference between killing and uh, the difference between letting somebody die. So there is a moral distinction between both of them. We, we know that, uh, uh, you know, a person who's terminally ill um, is invariably going to die. Or even if uh, there's a normal person, uh, that person will die one day. I'm going to die one day. You are also going to die one day. Okay. But when we proceed towards death in a natural fashion, in a natural manner, it's, it's not, uh, you know, it's like we are letting ourselves onto that path and uh, we're letting ourselves towards death, okay? We have to perish one day. We, we cannot be immortals, right? But then uh, when we talk about euthanasia, it is actually murder. All right, we are using one particular injection to, uh, with an uh, intention of putting an end to the person's life. All right, not putting an end to the suffering. We are putting an end to the life itself. So we are actually committing a murder. So euthanasia cannot be passive or active. There is nothing called passive or active euthanasia. Euthanasia is always an active act of murdering. Okay, it cannot be, uh, 
you know, passive. It cannot be, um, when we talk about say passive, you can, okay, we are not, you have not done anything for the patient to, uh, you know, uh, uh, not go towards death. And that is not euthanasia. We are allowing the patient to take the, uh, you know, road of or the path of uh, uh, getting a natural death, which invariably anytime, anywhere that patient is going to have or anybody for this reason is going to have. But then if we do something to stop uh, uh, his breath, to stop his heart from beating, we're actually committing a crime. We are actually killing that person. Okay, whatever our intention might be, it might be good that, okay, by putting an end to his life, we have put an end to his suffering. But then we do not have the right to do that. We, we cannot just kill people, okay? But we can let them, uh, their natural death to come to them, okay? So please understand this particular point. So, as I said, it is a deliberate intervention undertaken with the express intention of ending life to relieve intractable suffering. Our intention is to end the life and henceforth relieve intractable suffering. Okay? That is euthanasia. It cannot be passive. It can never be passive. Okay. So, uh, something called do not resuscitate. Uh, will you consider do not resuscitate advanced directives put forward by this particular lady to be, uh, uh, you know, euthanasia or for that reason, using morphine and other drugs to relieve pain because morphine might also, you know, for some reason, if mixed with uh, accidentally with benzodiazepines is actually going to cause respiratory depression for a patient. And if I, then you might lose the patient also. Are you intent, your intention uh, is to uh, perform euthanasia? Uh, is stopping treatment between, when the burden outweighs the benefit is also euthanasia? So it is, these things are not considered as part of euthanasia. Um, please read this book by Atil Gawande being mortal. It's an excellent book. He's um, you know, uh, a top a neurosurgeon practicing in, um, in the US. He has written a beautiful book on, uh, you know, the deaths uh, due to cancer, the uh, problems that he has faced while taking care of patients on chemotherapy, intensive care, surgery. And he said that ultimately death comes and no one is good at knowing when to stop, okay? So we have to check what we are going to do uh, to stop ourselves from uh, extending a person's suffering. So we really cannot afford to die in the ICU because 85% of healthcare spending in India is out of pocket, okay? 39 million Indians are becoming poorer per year, and this is not I am saying, it is the Lancet who is actually saying, most related uh, to aggressive medical interventions at the end of life. Can you imagine? We are making our, you know, um, terminal patients suffer like anything by doing aggressive medical interventions at the end of life. There's a 300% increase in inpatient expenditure in the last 10 years. So these are few facts because of which we really cannot afford to die. So today's take home message, please apply ethical principles against the background of respect to life, number one, and acceptance of the ultimate inevitability. So um, I would actually want to spend my last hours uh, personally, um, uh, something like this lady is being uh, spending and not like uh, somebody who's surrounded by machines and other stuff. So 
thank you so much for a patient hearing and uh, you know uh, you have been really uh, very um, uh, you have actually uh, pointed out such beautiful um, facts so thank you shri priya i think i have actually overshot i'm really sorry about that um, i i think we have a case presentation also so Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. As always, uh, you were like enlightening us for with the basic concepts of medical ethics. Thank you so much. And the our chats itself proved that the audience were also very much interactive throughout. Uh, we do have a case presentation which was sent in by Dr. Brochen, but unfortunately, he is in a place, Manipur. To be precisely where there is uh, the situation is bad, you I, know. I I'm so. here. I'm here. You are there. Thank you so much, yeah. Doctor. Uh, can I ask? Can I opine something regarding the euthanasia? Sure, please. Yeah, I I agree. But uh, to say that euthanasia is about killing, what if it is euthanasia is about killing? But according to the method that we use, it could be passive and active. so saying that everything is active uh for me it's a bit difficult uh from the moral angle to uh, uh so uh, it. yeah dr brojen um uh, perhaps uh, uh, you know you can uh, shri priya can actually send you the icmr guidelines on euthanasia um so uh, it is not uh, dr sangamitra who is actually telling you that there is uh this is uh only active um let me uh, clarify it to uh, not only to you but to everybody who is actually thinking on that these lines euthanasia can never be uh, passive there is nothing called uh, passive euthanasia because you are doing something i am repeating my words you are actually doing something to kill the patient to put an end to the life of the patient and this is what has been actually clarified by the uh, icmr itself so they have a we have a proper guideline on euthanasia this is the uh, you know uh, a mis uh, a kind of a myth and misnomer that is actually circulating in the society because uh, of uh, so many cases that are being uh, taken up by the supreme court and the supreme court doesn't have uh, uh, the experts uh, who can actually guide the uh, bench of judges about this so icmr has done it very properly i uh, i would sincerely request you to please uh, you know uh, see those guidelines where uh, they have put up wonderful guidelines they have put up um, a case based discussions on how uh, you should be taking up so it is not my personal take it is what no, i am, have done and what yeah, I, i am actually sharing with you i agree i'm not saying that it is wrong or right and it is uh, about the personal view this is my view for example if you would hold a treatment when a patient comes in as you have said dnr if you don't do anything now you consider that one is an action of doing something that's what you are no 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 dr brojen i think you are getting things wrong uh, when you do not do anything for the patient you are allowing natural process of uh, decaying of the body or the body getting you know giving up to the disease by itself my But question is are, there my question is then why we should not be doing anything because we have to stop somewhere you just cannot go on fighting with it when you yes. know that your fight will terminate uh, the patient in another bad condition why would you want to do it that may be the wish of the patient it may be it no, may be the is, wish of the patient that's what i'm saying again. now if you if you know that the wish of the patient is that Uh, till the last moment that is why we are talking about ethical issues okay that is the reason why we are considering ethical dilemmas this is a ethical dilemma that you are facing 
you are facing that the patient is wishing that he should be treated till the last. But your sense, uh, your good sense will say that I just cannot keep on doing this. Okay, this is a dilemma. And that is why we are discussing this thing today. Mm. I, okay. Are you getting my point, Dr. Bridget? No, I, I will very well get it, but there are more than that. Uh, that needs. To I be understand. I understand. It, it is difficult. It is not simple. It is, it is that that it's not a doctor's to... choice to say that one. The futility itself, even the doctors, they have controversy in deciding what is futile treatment. Yes. So that is the, the definition is... itself. Even the terminology has been challenged. Because I what is the meaning of uh, oh, lots of issues are there. So in that Please, way, uh, no, 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 no. I, I really, that, I, uh, no, Doctor Bridgen, I just cannot let you go uh, today. Okay, <laughs> fine. Class, uh, no, we'll, uh, we'll with this particular this learning. No, no, no. You have to get this. No, my my point is that to say conclusively that there is no passive active that that way uh, the way of saying I think uh, for me. It's a bit difficult to uh, no, digest that one. What I'm trying to say is that euthanasia there, some people might classify it according to the method as passive or the active. Uh, that can also be you know, taken into account. No, no, Absolutely. No, is, that there's nothing no, like no, that. No, that no, is no. something I, that, uh, is, that would be controversial. No, That's no. It, is, it cannot be controversy at all. Uh, please, I'm just taking this responsibility uh, of uh, telling you that uh, faculties of Pallium India or for that reason any other institutes in India who's teaching these guidelines on euthanasia will never ever you know teach uh, uh, the uh, classes or teach doctors or for that reason any other professionals the wrong thing please don't say that because um, you know, we, uh, 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 I am actually giving you the right kind of um, fact. I am putting this forward after a proper research and, uh, you know, my education is at, uh, will be at stake if you say that uh, people will have uh, this kind of a uh, uh, dilemma. It, it cannot be like that. Uh, uh, when you talk about a particular surgery, for example, uh, you know, appendicectomy, uh, you will have a proper SOP to follow. So this is what I am actually telling you. There is a proper SOP to follow even when you're talking about euthanasia. Okay. So when I say I take full responsibility of my words, when I talk about euthanasia, that there is nothing called passive or active, euthanasia is has always uh, to be an active act it cannot be uh, 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 the other way around. It cannot be passive at all. I, um, I understand for the first time when you talk about this, when uh, you know somebody is actually letting you know about these particular facts, you will have a, a dilemma that uh, I have till now learned about active and passive because people uh, have been talking like that. Um, I think you should go by the facts. And for that reason, I request Sri Priya to please send the ICMR guidelines to everybody in this particular uh, class so that they are enlightened about the facts. And please also go through the uh, guidelines uh, of the end of life care because these are extremely new things, uh, you know, which are going to help you later on in your life. Okay, you will not feel bad for any action that you've taken. Uh, I have the guideline. Anyway, thank you. Let's continue yeah. with the- uh, Yes, please. Am I audible? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brozen. And yes, of course, um, this, this is a platform where you express your views and there is nothing right, nothing wrong yeah. until we reach the correct conclusion. So we we are very open to the further discussion, Dr. Bojan, if you would like, you can just... Uh, yeah, it's, make okay. A, it's okay, fine, no problem, no problem. It takes its <laughs> light at all. You can never send across anymore. your views to us over mail so, and we can take it up further with Dr. Sangamitra as well. 
so uh, with your permission sir, sir shall we start with the case presentation now yeah 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 we can start. okay so oh, sorry my video is not working i am at home So I'm, I am going to briefly present a case uh, who died at the age of 86 years as a female. Uh, the diagnosis was dementia, um, moderate to severe, and cause is undetermined. Uh, now coming to the presenting complaints, as says, uh, she didn't have any presenting complaint, showed signs of decline in cognitive function over the years. Uh, of course, he didn't have any sense of place, time, a person, and trouble with the daily uh, activities of daily living. Not by physical cause, of course, uh, because he, she can't exactly understand what she is doing. That is the reason why she had a problem, for example, brushing or having the toilet or trouble with eating and brushing teeth. And at the latter stage, At the latest days, uh, there was a lump uh, you know, discovered. And it, this cognitive decline, it lasted nearly 10 years from 2012 to 2022, injuries including uh, fracture, wandering around, mood swings, unexplained gestures where the pieces, prominent pieces throughout the years. Finally, as it was bad region for nearly eight weeks, in the last three, four weeks, she is on the total parental nutrition, oxygen, antibiotics, pain, and medication. And in between also, she had lots of other medications uh, for different purposes. Next, please. Except for the cognitive decline, no discernible abnormality till the last 10 to 12 months. Uh, she has signs of COVID infection, and not tested antigenic test, but from the antibody test that was done later. And a lump in the liver discovered in the last days, uh, that is nearly eight to 10 weeks of life. So these are the investigations during that course, routine blood examination, x-ray test, CT scan, uh, lump in the liver, and that's MRI and the CT scan so it's increase of the uh, <coughs> increase of the brain mass. Uh, it's mainly supported. There were episodic, uh, in the psychological aspect, there were episodic mood swings, uh, sometimes happy, sometimes sad, sometimes angry, uh, prolonged, there were problems with the prolonged care from the caretaker's point of view in terms of their health and the concerns, the sense of helplessness, subjective norms, that is gullibility, that is about the, um, the significant people in and around uh, the family, uh, they were having their own opinion that you should be doing like this, you should be doing like this, you should go for this, that sort of thing. So a whole lot of uh, confusion uh, surrounding the decision making uh, because of the presence of the other's opinion. That is the meaning of the subjective norm. That was really a problem for the family members to decide. Medications were mainly for symptomatic management, no specific treatment. In between, also for the mood swings, it was prescribed many medications by the psychiatrist, but it's of no value, so it was stopped. Uh, central venous catheter, IV drips, total parental nutrition, oxygen, and pain medications were given, including morphine. Next, please. So main concern is about the decision making in terms of what was really happening, uh, because he can't express what was really happening. So the family member had to guess or imagine from the judges, from the way that she was behaving or showing it. And uh, what was supposed to be done again in terms of the investigation and treatment, there was lots of uh, uh, problem in making that decision. Uh, then psychological health of the caretakers uh, was a significant uh, consideration to be met for that long year taking care with a sense of helplessness and significant others' opinion uh, that were also very important for the family members because if they don't do it, if they were feeling guilty about it and if they do what could be wrong, those are the problems faced by the uh, family members. 
even with the doctors also, they have different opinion that you should be doing like, you know, it's not good that, that uh, something of that sort. So they, these were the main concern for the family regarding that case. So in summary, an elderly woman having dementia that progressed slowly in 10 years with trouble ADL, finally making her bad reading with a lump in the liver. Decision on management was difficult as no meaningful communication was feasible. Health of the caretaker, sense of helplessness, avoiding subjective norm was a dominant, uh, were dominant features in this case. So this question point is all about you know, making decision, who's going to make decision, are the decisions correct uh, based on the, you know, the gestures she was showing because she can't express whether she had pain or not. So whether that decision itself, uh, whether what symptom or what uh, sign or symptom that patient was having, that itself was a problem. And then what was supposed to be done in terms of the diagnosis as well as uh, treatment was also sort of a problem. Uh, there might be you know, differences in uh, opinion uh, among the doctors and the family members. And that's about the futility of treatment that's related to the uh, previous one. Uh, something in terms of investigations, uh, for example, going for liver biopsy, uh, going for the many other scan, uh, that sort of things, uh, whether it's going to be useful or not, or in terms of the treatment, whatever is being given by the psychiatrist or many other people, whether they are going to be useful or not. So there's a whole lot of uh, controversy regarding that one. So that was really a problem to decide. And doctrine of uh, the principle of double effect, that was uh, at last days, it was given morphine intermittently. Uh, and that was something whether if you increase this doors again, it might lead to you know, sedation and then even that. So there, there was some problem with that one when we discussed with the doctor. Then psychological health of the caretakers, including the, the subjective norms, as I said before, uh, this was the discussion point. Thank you. Thank you, doctor, for bringing in that case. So, participants, other participants would like to share their insights on the same before we hand over to Dr. Sangamitra for her final words. Uh, so, actually, by doing this advanced investigations for a 10 years, she is suffering from dementia. Are we going to do a definite, uh, definitive surgery or any other procedures? And are we thinking that the patient is going to be all right after the surgery? And how are how at her uh, this stage she will withstand the surgery or chemotherapy? If it is a malignant thing, chemotherapy and the further treatment and, uh, without uh, she is not able to express. And we don't know anything regarding her pain score or anything whether she's comfortable whether is this her wish to continue like this we cannot make out anything so as such we are letting the patient suffer as well as the relatives the caretakers also suffer for the past 10 years is it right legally right or ethically right i am not sure but if sure it is that. somebody of mine i would prefer to give just a supportive care. I will not go for the liver biopsy and other things. I'll let her have a peaceful departure. That's what I wish. That was exactly done in this case. But I was highlighting thank, thank about you, making that decision. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other comments from anyone? Sangamitra, ma'am, I believe. Yes, I, I was just waiting for comments uh -huh. from the house because. I think uh, this is a very interesting uh, case that has been presented. 
um, uh, and uh, has uh, you know if we keep on discussing then uh, there'll be a huge load of uh, inputs from everybody i'm sure um, so i put my um, uh, comment in the chat box and uh, main main thing that i need to concentrate is on the uh, on the goals of care for this particular patient you know and uh, what are we going to achieve out of our actions for this particular patient so rest of the things all set aside what are the goals of care for this particular patient and what are we going to achieve by uh, our actions directed to for this patient so these two questions i want to answer myself and then proceed so uh, maybe uh, if anybody wants to add to this uh, that will be a great thing because it's a very um, you know pertinent uh, uh, kind of a uh, case that has been presented and we definitely uh, get to see such patients um, over and over again in our practice so maybe uh, people could join in i think dr rama devi has um, actually written that she would like to give a supportive care yeah when we talk to the family members uh, since it's dementia as of now uh, we don't have any curative treatment for that one is going to be more of a supportive one but at the latter stage uh, having found a liver lump in the liver which is supposed to be a tumor which not as it proved from the scan and others the doctors were opining that it could be a tumor a malignant one because it happened so suddenly again uh, doing for the investigations at that age and a later part of the when she was bad reading uh, so that was the discussion with the family members that the goal of the treatment or goal of management for such a case should be uh, supportive and rather than uh, curative it should be on the focusing on the quality of life improvement of the quality of life and at the end of course uh, the so called having a good death i i completely agree with you uh, dr brijan yes absolutely i would act, i would have done the same thing i think uh, you and your team have really done a great job by actually uh, you know curtailing everything because at the age of 86 i think um, you know uh, she must have lived a great life and um, uh, although she has been a patient of dementia has been suffering since a long time but then um, i'm sure the care process uh, that was designed for her Uh, must have been a great one um, you know including um, the uh, contributions from the family members and the treating team um, uh, but then yes accidental finding of um, a liver tumor um, may just uh, give us a signal that um, this patient uh, uh, might be um, uh, you know going away uh quite soon and um, that might also actually uh give us a different um, angle to think about uh what more can be done uh, uh to make this patient a little more um uh you know calmer or little more um uh satisfied uh with the treatment so that uh you know she Uh, gets a peaceful life till she leaves this world so i would uh, surely uh, uh, you know uh, give a kudos to you and your team for for this particular treatment yes absolutely uh, you've done a great job yeah uh, dr swati has also actually yes uh, Uh, any kind of uh, dilemma that you may have faced uh, dr brojan during this uh, particular yeah, the issue. dilemma is about you know, what exactly she is having is it a pain or is it a you know, simple discomfort because she can't express anything she can't she complain anything so the decision is to be taken by the family members 
and they were not so sure whether or whether she is have she was having pain or not. That itself is another dilemma for them. Second one is about you know, taking decision for the investigation as well as for treatment because there are lots of uh, opinions from the significant others as well as from the, even the doctors also. That is another one. And of course, when they give the, uh, that's related to, again, the futility of the treatment or the diagnosis, whatever it is. And lastly, of course, they, she was given some morphine uh, because they thought that she was having pain uh, from the gestures that she was showing, uh, the facial gestures and all. Yeah. So they're also uh, giving morphine. Uh, they were not quite sure because the assessment cannot be done properly at home. So again, that is why I brought up the uh, yeah. doctor. So, um, uh, for your question, for the first question of decision making in terms of what was happening? Um, mm. I think uh, uh, you could actually, uh, you know, refer to the dementia scales that are um, present in the uh, literature. That is one. Uh, mm. Secondly, we have a proper pain scoring system for children, uh, for neonates, um, for adults, for people who cannot speak or hear or see. And uh, you can actually use those particular pain rating scales to find out whether the patient has pain. And if at all the patient is having pain, what is the intensity of the pain and what kind of pain? So these, there are certain scales. I'm sure that um, uh, I don't know whether you have been taught about uh, not yet. I, I would love to have that. Uh, yeah, that I think yeah. uh, uh, Shri Priya uh, will be will have uh, given you the plans about uh, pain management and uh, you know assessment and everything. I'm sure you're going to have uh, wonderful classes on that. And um, no, uh, we had we had that class, but uh, not for this case. Uh, such type of case, for example, the one who cannot say anything, who cannot. In the, even if seeing also, she can't say anything for okay. such type of patients. Okay. The rating so, of the pain, the eliciting pain, the, yeah. that she can make. Yeah. Right. So uh, maybe you can just, uh, you know, um, uh, go to a Google Scholar or uh, whatever journal uh, uh, you have subscription to, um, to find about uh, pain rating skills in patients with dementia, you know. There is a lot of information in the internet um, and um, uh, these are validated tools also. So uh, they are going to help you in finding out that particular. Okay. Okay. I'll do that. Okay. And um, uh, of course, I mean, uh, uh, you, you can also think about terminal restlessness uh, in this particular patient because um, 10 years of dementia is actually advanced dementia. And when we talk about advanced dementia, we do consider the patient to be terminally ill, okay? So you can actually th think about um, terminal care for this particular patient, okay? So that is really going to give you more clarity on what was supposed to be done for this particular patient. Um, regarding futility of treatment, yes, um, uh, you know, we have had a very great discussion on which treatment might be futile and uh, uh, considering the doctrine of double effect um, uh, if you are thinking about usage of morphine for this particular patient uh, <clears throat> if you uh, have if your intention to use morphine was to induce um, drowsiness or sedation then i think um, morphine is not the right choice uh, because morphine is considered to be a pain management um, medication, a strong opioid. For palliative sedation, we have other drugs uh, like uh, lorazepam. We have midazolam to induce a palliative sedation. Um, that can be definitely used. And of course, uh, anything that you do uh, does uh, follow the rule of uh, doctrine of double effect. Okay, um, the last but uh, I think psychosocial health of the caretakers, including subjective norms, absolutely uh, important, you know, very, very important because 
ten uh, years of dementia, and you know, uh, perhaps just one person in the family always going around with this particular patient. Uh, that particular caretaker needs to be, uh, you know, taken care of. She must, uh, she or he uh, must have, um, you know, a some time off uh, from this particular job that she is doing. Uh, so I think you have really uh, brought up a very good uh, question of taking care, uh, you know, of, and at the same time, uh, you know, for dementia patients, uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the treating team also uh, needs a lot of self-care. So I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, you can actually look up more into uh, self-care, more into uh, patients with dementia, uh, how to, uh, you know, improve on managing terminal um, terminality uh, uh, of dementia patients. I think those things uh, you 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 should look into that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the another angle that I'm not mentioning here, uh, it could be important for many other families is the you know, the economic uh, situation of the family, economic condition of the family. Having such a long uh, chronic illness and treating them. It might need a lot of money for that one, but uh, that is also another aspect. But for this family, it's a well-to-do, so it wasn't that much of a problem. But for some other family, it's going to be you know, a whole lot of a problem again. Absolutely. I agree with you so much, uh, Dr. Bridgen, because um, financial, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, financial constraints or... Uh, if I could say, uh, the financial instability of a um, particular family uh, is the result of uh, the excessive healthcare costs that uh, uh, people go through nowadays. And we never know, we might be in that situation after some years, uh, you know. So uh, I think, yes, uh, that is an important thing that we need to look into. But... Um, I really don't have an answer to that particular issue because, uh, you know, uh, until and unless the government actually takes up uh, some kind of a decision to replicate or, uh, you know, copy some bit of NHS uh, ideas or ideals, uh, our patients uh, may not have a proper healthcare coverage in the coming years. Yes. I so, think the uh, the psychiatry uh, psychiatry association and the Pilim can uh, advocate to the government that is, some part of it can be covered with the Ayushman Bharat or whatever scheme the governments are having. So, so I so agree with you absolutely. Yes, a uh, great presentation. I mean, this is a eye opening uh, presentation. Uh, you know, I'm sure uh, many of us uh, today must have seen a patient of uh, a long-standing chronic disease who must be having um, a similar kind of situations that uh, Dr. Brojen has right now faced. Thank you so much for this presentation. And uh, yeah, if we, uh, Shri Priya, uh, maybe over to you. Um, mm -hmm. We do Thank not you. have any other questions. You can just wind up. Thank you, Dr. Sargamitra. Thank you so much for joining us and walking us through such a wonderful session. And I believe even the case was uh, so uh, relevant and a very good case, as you mentioned. Thank you so much, Dr. Brojan. And especially since uh, now you are in Manipur and the situation is very bad there, but still you found out time and situation to join us and did the case presentation. Thank you especially for that. And thank you everyone for joining in and with the promise that we'll be meeting again in the next session with another eminent faculty joining in. This is Sri Priya along with Dr. Sangamitra Bora signing off from the Tipsy Hub. See you in the next session. Till then everyone take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.